All right. So this one is divine impassibility. So I hear every time. That was the first time. I'll blab now. So I drew a picture. The picture is of classical theology above the line and modern theology below the line. And all this is meant to show is the impression that so much of modern theology has. And so as we transition from immutability to impassibility, um, let's get a little bit of the context and see what people naturally sense about all this. Um, the idea that God is in process, and by the way, that, that's a term, process theology. Um, and you'll see, let, let's throw a couple of these up here. Process theology was really big at the turn of the 20th century. And, and, but again, because of what it is, it really still is big. And then um, several, two generations later, our own generation, certainly mine, has experienced open theism, which is really doing some of the same things with respect to foreknowledge and free will that process theology just does in general. And so that's a real theology. Um, famous thinkers, Alfred North Whitehead, the, um, the famous mathematician and philosopher, um, was a process, not so much a theologian, but that's the view of God he had. And then Charles Hartshorn and others were um, famous process theologians. Um, we'll talk about open theism in more specifics in a future week. But the idea that God is in process is really a basic foundational assumption to modern theology in general. Being in a process. Think about that for a second. Um, even growing. Well, here's the world, and here's, oh, I don't know, moment number one to the future, and people in it, and so God is, in some, some people's view, God's even not just moving with, but He's also, in a sense, growing with, becoming. So think of the difference again between being versus becoming. This is a fundamental assumption to all modern theology. And the, I, the reason it is, is because this is seen to be the very essence of what it means to be a person. And so I have under the line personal and over the line unchanging. No, my God is not a static, timeless, unchanging block of Greek speculation. Probably, if he is moving at all, he's in a library looking at books. He can't be bothered with human suffering and so forth. That's the idea. Um, but that's what it means to be a person, doesn't it? Is to be involved, to be near. But it may be that the existentialist's explicit maxim that existence precedes essence. That was one of the, that's really why it's called existentialism. Existence precedes essence. What does that mean? Well, for one, it meant human nature. That's really the focus of it for Jean-Paul Sartre and others. But the idea there is that we don't have natures. We don't come with natures, a fully formed product determined ahead of time. But we can, in a sense, authenticate ourselves and make ourselves. Of course, this isn't happening still today, but that might be true of God too, says the modern theologian, that perhaps God exists, number one, but let's put a question mark over here, and that he is becoming, he's becoming something else. Uh, why would he become anything? Well, that has, it depends. If he really loves the creature, it'll have something to do with the creature. This is the thinking of modern theology. Now, when you run into it in church or, you know, somebody says, my God wouldn't do that or don't put God in a box or I like to think of God as this. And, you know, they're not necessarily using language like this. They don't have diagrams going off in their brains. I understand that. But, but people that were thinking were thinking this and, and changing the way that seminarians and pastors thought about 
how you could think about God. And in this way, if you read that idea, existence precedes essence, back into the divine, then God could be whatever we wanted him to be. But let's say, for example, that you prefer to think of yourself as more conservative than that. You could still say that God could be whatever he wanted to be, right? So now it's not us manipulating God. Uh, God is not a mirror for me. Therefore, God's not becoming whatever I want him to to be, but maybe God's becoming whatever he wants to be. So we pay a little homage to God's own determination to become. And we see that crop up again in conservative churches in every generation that don't study classical theology. So what does this next attribute mean that he is impassable? So not just unchanging, but impassable. Well, note the word. It comes from a Latin word, passio, which is suffering. And that is to suffer. And so the idea here is that the essence of God, the divine essence, cannot suffer. In fact, I don't have this in my notes, but one of the, I mentioned on Sunday, what was it? Monothelitism, one will. There's an obscure heresy. Here's another one. Patria Passionism. Now, is this just something, you know, somebody had too much time on their hands? No, because that would be the father suffering. And there's all sorts of assumptions of why they would come to that conclusion. If the son is one with the father and they're one in essence and the son and the communicatio idiomatum, the human nature is going to the divine nature. Therefore, what's good for one is good for the other because it's good for the other. So it's kind of two steps of that kind of union. Now there's equivocations firing off everywhere, but apparently it's not firing off. And so that mistake is being made that the Father, namely that the divine essence is suffering to begin with. And all of the early theologians would have said, no, that is not happening. Now we've already run into the idea that God must have motion in himself. So that misreading of Augustine. Since it had already been established that God is the prime mover, whatever you want to call this motion or activity, it's better to understand it in the Thomistic language of pure act that we've already demonstrated. So think of the difference between the concepts active versus passive for a second, just in language even. Active versus passive. This is active. This is passive. Now, if God is in pure act, there's nothing in him that's potential, and so we have to say no to that. And that's really all we mean here. Applied to particular things. So it's not really that simple because once you see some of the complaints that are rising up from modern theology. Now in saying that God, you know, because there's, okay, so can we talk about emotions? But now we're just talking about emotions that are unified, simple, without passions. So maybe there's a distinction there. And even that's an argument. Even you go back to the Puritans, they use the word affection. But affection is used in the classical authors to mean that which is affected. It's pretty much a synonym for this. But people use those words differently. We just have to be careful that we're using them in the right context. And so if we say that God, and I'm going to put these three words on the board, and I'm running out of room already. If we say... I'll do it over there. And I'll just pick these three things, that God values, prefers, and chooses one thing over another. So this is the God who is simple. And let's say that he values, what did I say, chooses, oh, prefers. And the only difference I mean here between preferring and choosing is the acting out of it. Although, you know, why is it worth distinguishing? Well, because this is where a lot of the mistakes are going to come in. We immediately, we run the traffic the wrong way in our analogical thinking. And we say, without knowing that that's what we're saying, that, well, I value like this. I go to the store. Nobody says that. Yes, you are. You are saying it. You're just not using those words and hand signals. And so when we value and prefer and choose... That involves all sorts of things. It does not follow that God values and prefers and chooses one thing over another, that God must react to the 
enemies of those things in order to have a particular stance to it, or that he reacts to options. Sim would suggest that he, that he uh, isn't aware of one or the other, or he just got to it, like you would just come up to the products in the store and start to evaluate it. And we, and we again, we're just unaware that that's what we're doing. We're imposing that the analogy is going the wrong way. Instead of going this way, the analogy is running this way. And so these things don't follow. Our creaturely experience, so now down here, our creature, creaturely experience of value is to discover. If I value something, I have discovered its value. I had to evaluate it to value. And we are imposing that on God. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Our experience of choice is of limitation. Why do we choose? Scarcity. It's one way to say it. It's the way an economist would say it. Uh, naturally, our experience of feeling will be the kind of passion that is entirely affective, the way that I described it before. It's essentially potentiality. We are being affected from outside of ourselves. Some external impress upon our hearts of some good thing that we lack, some good thing that we lost, or some bad thing that we fear, or some bad thing by which we have been harmed is coming in. But all of those just mean potentiality, which we have already disproven of the first cause. Now, definition and testimony, these are going to have to overlap here because of how difficult the objections needlessly make this doctrine. Let me quote two theologians on how the early church fathers understood divine impassibility. Why would I do this? Because it is very misunderstood what the early church fathers thought about divine impassibility. And you see all sorts of fallacious ways that this is smuggled in. But these are the good guys first. From his book, Does God Suffer? Uh, Thomas Wayne Andy uh, writes, quote, For the fathers... To deny that God is passable is to deny of him all human passions and the effects of such passions, which would in any way debilitate or cripple him as God. Thus, to say that God is impassable is again to ensure and to accentuate his perfect goodness and unalterable love. By the way, a perfect goodness is better than a not perfect goodness, and an unalterable love is a steadier uh, foundation for you to be loved than an alterable love. Hint, hint, clue, clue at the practical punchline of this. Okay? Very, very important. Then to one of the great patristic scholars of the modern era, uh, G.L. This guy has a lot of good-looking books. Uh, he was a, a couple generations ago, but uh, G.L., and it's, it looks like prestige. I had not heard of this guy until last year when I was reading uh, Mascal and even Dolezal's book. They quote from him. But man, a lot of good looking books on. And he was one of the uh, experts of the patristic thinkers. But anyway, he said this, quote, It is clear that impassibility means not that God is inactive or uninterested. Remember, that's the, that's the claim. Not that God is inactive or uninterested. Not that he surveys existence with epicurean impassibility from the shelter of a metaphysical isolation up here in his library. He doesn't care about his wife and kids and, and all the suffering because he's reading a book. That's the idea. I'm telling you, they're going to bring in Plato and Aristotle in a second. Same way we bring in Hitler, they're going to bring in Plato and Aristotle. I'm telling you, it's coming. Um, Sorry, I'm interrupting him. Not that he surveys existence with an Epicurean impassibility from the shelter of a metaphysical isolation, but that his will is determined from within instead of being swayed from without. Stop right there. What's the difference between what Prestige is saying here and what Bruce Ware said? He is moving so long as his, his will. That's a good question, but I'm going to wait because I'm going to quote J.I. Packer to the same effect as Ware. And I'm going to, at that point, we're going to, we're going to compare them and say, what's the difference? He's saying that God's will is determined from within instead of being swayed from without. So he's totally involved, more involved than you think by pulling him down from the heavens. But he's moved, moved? Okay, so that's the balance. And he says, it safeguards the truth that the impulse alike in providential order and in redemption and sanctification come from the will of God. In other words, 100% from 
in and of God. We'll come back to that because I understand how that language can trip people up. Moving? Is he moving? Is he moved? Is he moved? Is he, there's a little card trick and just a little bit of sound waves off can affect how we hear it. Testimony, real quick. How on earth can we say that impassibility is taught in Scripture? In fact, it looks like the exact opposite. That's going to be the challenge because there's nothing that says, you know, well, I, I erased it, my word, anthropomorphism. There's nothing that says anthropomorphism coming and sticker anthropomorphism. Okay, I grant that. But just do a little bit of good and necessary consequence from verses like God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Not simply that God has love in the sense of experiencing a possession of it, merely a valuation preference of it or choosing it as if he's coming up to it or assessing it or reacting to it. But in fact, he is love. His essence is love. He is an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, 3. He is a God on the other side who feels indignation every day. So he's in days. We'll come to that. We'll get to time. But again, remember, it's using language, that accommodation that we can understand. Every day will mean here constantly. But why doesn't he just say static? Because that's what you'd hear. Static and busy. Too busy for you. That's what you'd hear if he said that. So he accommodates to our level. Now, again, if you want, now, how do, I, how do I do good and necessary consequence when I'm doing biblical theology and I'm going left to right in the narrative? Uh, revisit session five in our prolegomena section, and we talk about the different divisions of theology. For now, I just have to skip it and say anthropomorphism, but I will come back to that and justify it. Okay, the impassibility of God has uh, certainly been the testimony of the early church, the medieval church, and the Protestant scholastics, and the Puritans all retained it. It's only, again, in the 19th and 20th century that you have this rush of, based on this assumption of process, that it can't be that. To be personal can't be unchanging, and so forth. Anselm argues this. He says, quote, When we state that God undergoes some lowliness or weakness, we understand this to be in accordance with the weakness of the human substance which he assumed in the incarnation. So he doesn't even go with anthropomorphism. He's just restricting himself to the incarnation. I think that's a limited argument, but I think that's part of it. Anselm says, not in accordance with the sublim sublimity of his impassable divine nature, end quote. Calvin, Calvin and his institutes commented on the repentance passages, repentance of God, of what he would have done in those uh situations. Um, but Calvin says that in special revelation, God accommodated to our capacity so that we may understand it. He's going to say almost word for word what Clement of Alexandria said. Calvin says, now the mode of accommodation is for him to represent himself to us, not as he is in himself, but as he seems to us. Although he is beyond all disturbance of mind, that's another way to say, well, it's another application of impassibility. He is beyond all disturbance of mind. Whenever we hear that God is angered, we ought not to imagine any emotion or passion in him, but rather to consider that this expression has been taken from our own human experience. Again, if we complain to Calvin, oh, that's convenient, and why? Then God may say to us, fine, I'll communicate my entire infinity all at once. Good luck with your head not exploding yesterday. Okay, so, you know, we're asking for him to explain every relationship of all of his relationships in every proposition. That just misunderstands how human thought and language works. Objections. Here we run directly into all the sensibilities of modern theology, and you'll see it in all the objections. At the extremes are process theology and open theism. But it was Karl Barth that articulated the emotive life of God that God is nevertheless Lord over. So again, same kind of thing as a little bit in John Frame, but certainly we've seen it explicitly in Bruce Ware. Um, he's being moved. He is in concurrence with us that way, horizontally, relationally. But in, Bart is careful to say that God is initiating all of this. Very subtle. So Bart says this, quote, The personal God has a heart. He can feel and be affected. He is not impassable. He cannot be moved from the outside by an extraneous power. So you see what he's saying? He's not impassable. Now, I'm going to agree with you that he can't be moved from the outside by an extraneous power. He's impassable that far. 
But, Bart says, this does not mean that he is not capable of moving himself. Again, what do you mean by that? Do you mean pure act? Then we're cool. If you don't, what do you mean? No, Bart says, God is moved and stirred, yet not like ourselves in powerlessness, but in his own free power, in his innermost being, moved and touched by himself. And, and Dolezal caught this as well, you know, when you allude to some innermost part of God. Well, no, I don't mean part. Okay, what do you mean? by inner, if, you, if you look deep enough in God, what do you mean by that? Okay, so uh, that, that's a good thing to, to keep your antenna up for when modern theologians are talking. J.I. Packer, the beloved J.I. Packer, who we all love and we learn so much from in books like Knowing God and Concise Theology, a book that I have worked with people, discipled people with, um, you know, 15, 16 years ago, used that book. It's right there somewhere. And Packer attempts to honor this classical attribute, but with this proviso. Packer says that theologians mean, by impassibility, not that he is impassive and unfeeling, but that what he feels, like what he does, is a matter of his own deliberate, voluntary choice. I'm, I'm kind of okay so far. And is included in the unity of his infinite being. God is never our victim in the sense that we make him suffer where he had not first chosen to suffer. Wait a minute. Rewind. And, and in the sense that we make him suffer where he had not first chosen to suffer. So he, he initiates it. He initiates what? Okay, notice the difference between how Packer said that as opposed to Prestige's statement. Remember Prestige had said that his will is determined from within instead of being swayed from without. So let's draw two pictures. So here's what Prestige is saying. Here's what and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to straw man by linking Ware and Packer together because Ware had said it in a more, in a broader context. But I think you'll see that Packer is really saying the same thing at the end of the day about God's uh, suffering and his feeling and so forth. Prestige is saying that his will is determined from within instead of being swayed from without. And so all he's talking about is his will. And in the terms of a logical relationship, if you want to do these arrows, not that God is walking in a circle or pacing while he's deciding, that's not the idea, but, but let's just go with that. He's saying it's not determined from the outside. No. But he's saying that that, that, that will in him. So there's a kind of motion, again, if, and he would admit pure act, whereas they were not saying the same thing. They're saying, no, God does determine the whole thing, just like prestige has here. Okay, determine what though? And so as you're walking out this um, relationship with human beings, he's determining a whole lot of things, but he's suffering. I'll put number three here. And in, in Packer's statement, there's a suffering. He's determined it. He's determined to be, um, to be moved by us. And that's not the same thing as that he's moving if you'll pardon the sloppy language, moving himself doesn't mean caused himself. They're just reaching for language there, okay, to make a comparison. Um, so, so both seem to be saying that God's emotive, valuative, volitional life come from within God's eternal life, but prestige fences that off to any ad extra causation, including subsequent divinely chosen ad extra causation. Packer's saying, no, God chooses it. It is divinely, sovereignly determined but it still add extra causation on something in God. To hear a voice from inside, now we'll go extreme to the process theology camp, Charles Hartshorn, I mentioned him. He used the example of a parent-child relationship, and he's making the point that, look, the God I see in Scripture is here, okay? Um, not that he's not transcendent in some ways, but he, he looks at a parent-child relationship, and to different scenarios of discipline that would be morally praiseworthy and morally blameworthy. And especially um, blameworthy is a parent who's utterly indifferent. They're lacking love 
uh, more than any other. And so he concludes, quote, yet God, we are told, is impassive and immutable and without accidents. That kind of a God is just as he would be in his actions and knowledge and being had we never existed or had all our experiences been otherwise. In other words, we don't matter to him because we don't affect him. In fact, doesn't we don't ah affect him with an A mean the same thing as we don't matter to him? That's what he's saying. And at first glance, it is an understandable, natural, normal argument. There's passages of scripture that certainly appear to show God experiencing emotions as any other person. That's the key uh, caveat there. Classical theologian, again, is going to appeal to anthropomorphism. So when you look at these verses, Genesis 6.6, 6, and this is a famous passage, the days of Noah, it says that God was sorry that he had made man. He was sorry that he had made man. Judges 2.18, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning, because of those who afflicted and oppressed them, that's double causing of God's pity. Judges 10, 16, God became impatient over the misery of Israel. Isaiah 63, 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Jeremiah 14, 17, you shall say to them this word, he's speaking to the prophet to tell them, let my eyes, my eyes, run down with tears night and day and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. What do you do with all that? And my first answer is, look at the Jeremiah passage for some clues. Does God have eyes and can tears run down them? And does he run out of daylight where he lives, where those tears run down like that? Of course, it's an anthropomorphism. That would be my first clue. I'll come back with some more in just a second. But this is not to water down those verses. What I'm going to say and what the classical theologians actually mean by impassable and a God of pure act is actually going to be more pity than the pity that you want by dragging him down. A more powerful um, yearning for the good of his people a more powerful than if he's affected in any potentiality in himself. And we'll come back to that. But same objection can be raised on a philosophical level. It's not simply the notion of change when it comes to creation or incarnation. We looked at it in the last hour. But every time the disposition of God is seen to change in relation to another personal agent, it would seem that not only is there a change in God, but a change in personal disposition at that. Stephen Charnock, the Puritan, answers this. And notice how he utilizes, by the way, um, the same in say versus ad extra breakdown that we've been seeing throughout. In other words, in him, in God's self, in his being, in his life, versus in his effects. Um, Charnock says this, The unchangeableness of God, when considered in relation to the exercise of his attributes in the government of the world, consists not in always acting in the same manner. However, cases and circumstances may alter. So in other words, when you're considering him in the exercises of his attributes, in other words, when you're considering, when you're thinking about God by looking at, ad extra, that which is not God. So that's our first clue. Um, but in always doing what is right and adapting his treatment of his intelligent creatures to the variation of their actions and characters. How, how does he want to speak about himself? In relation to the variations of their actions and characters. Their actions and their characters are changing because God cares about that and because God wants you to be righteous and not unrighteous. He's going to appear as if he's moving with you so that you know what he's pointing at when he says, you heathen. It's not the proper time to say, but what would that look like in God? That's the wrong question. And so he's speaking to us in a narrative sense, dealing with our actions and characters, which do vary. We're, we're a moving target, though God is not. When the devils, now fallen, stood as glorious angels, uh, Charnock says, they were the objects of God's hatred because impure. I think he might have an, 
in view of the passage in Job, which says he charges even his angels, because otherwise the sentence is awkward. But um, Charnock ends it by saying, the same reason which made him love them while they were pure made him hate them when they were criminal. Same reason in God, the same love in God made him, even Charnock's doing it in his sentence explaining it. He has to use language like made him. Oh, God made himself at that point. Charnock would have slapped you and said, stop it. You talk like this too. This is the way we have to talk. Our sentences, subject and predicate deal with moving objects. And now we're talking about the simple God. And so simply his love explains why, add extra, he loves the angels when they are pure and hates them when they are impure. But it is that same love which is exemplified in both, which is the moving target, not this up here. Everybody follow that? Okay. And the clearest expression of the problem comes from the 20th century theologian Jürgen Moltmann. And now you really get into it when you start getting into sort of liberation, the, uh, theolo theologies of hope, which is what I think one of the names Moltmann's theology went by. But he says this, and, and, he, and I say this because the, he just makes it clear what this is really saying, this whole attitude. He says, a God who cannot suffer is poorer than any man. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, he gives you his reasons. For a God who is incapable of suffering is a being who cannot be involved. By the way, Moltmann's writing right after World War II. The world is traumatized by what they just saw. Theologians are in that world. Happens in New Testament studies. So much of the new perspectives on Paul and the third wave of the quest for the historical Jesus were born out of the question of how do you do this without anti-Semitism, which is a good question. It's not how to do theology. And, and so you get things like that. And people in their theology proper can do it too. And so he says, for a God who is incapable of suffering is a being who cannot be involved. Suffering and injustice do not affect him. And because he is so completely insensitive up here, he cannot be affected or shaken by anything. That's a moral defect. He cannot weep, for he has no tears. But the one who cannot suffer cannot love either. So he is a loveless being. Here's the first smuggle I was just talking about. Aristotle's God cannot love. My first question to uh, Moltmann right there, and I can do it because I can close the book and I got highlighters. If he was talking, I, I don't know if I could do it. I couldn't break in. I want to say, Aristotle's God? How'd he come into this? Aristotle's not in the Bible. I like Aristotle, but how'd you smuggle in him right here? So if impassable, therefore Aristotle's God. Well, he didn't say those words. It's what he means. It's a, it's a red herring stuffed in a straw man right in your face while he's reminding you of the Holocaust. So you didn't notice it. Aristotle's God cannot love. He can only be loved by all non-divine beings, by virtue of his perfection and beauty, and in this way, draw them to him. The unmoved mover is a loveless being. Sorry, is a loveless beloved. So, so Aristotle's God can be loved because he could be admired, and in his uh, centrifugal motion of thinking only about himself, he can then draw the rest of the cosmos up to him. But he doesn't care about you. He doesn't think, he can't think about anything but his own perfection. Okay, uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, now let me give you the good side. This is really one of the clearest expressions all the way back in the turn of the third century. Yes, turn of the third century by Tertullian. Tertullian gives one of the classic, really undressings of this kind, almost as he was prophetically looking at process theology. They must have been, they must have been getting this objection back then too. And so Tertullian says, quote, these sensations in the human being, Emotions, values, preferences, so, but especially emotions. These sensations in the human being are rendered just as corrupt by the corruptibility of man's substance as in God they are rendered incorruptible by the incorruption of the divine essence. And Tertullian adds, It is palpably absurd of you to be placing human characteristics in God rather than divine ones in man. The only reason you can talk about love. We're right back to Plato is because love subsists. What you call static, it has to exist unchangeably. The only reason you talk about pity is because it is transcendent first. That's what Tertullian's saying. And then Tertullian says, this is ridiculous for you to speak about him like, like this, with the traffic going this way, when in fact the only 
conceivable way for the traffic of analogy to go is that way. And he says, and clothing God in the likeness of man instead of man in the image of God. I think in that short sentence, Tertullian really, really gets to the heart of what's wrong with all modern theology, pulling God down to the heaven. Let's make him closer to us. Um, Now, there's a historical objection, which ultimately amounts to the same thing as the philosophical, but here the emphasis is on the origin of the ideas, which incidentally is always a good way to commit the genetic fallacy if you're not careful. Nothing wrong with pointing out the origin of ideas. I love that study myself, but never dismiss an idea just because that bum over there thought of it because that could be an ad hominem, but more, you know, even if you don't attack the character, it could be a genetic fallacy. And I already said, Moltmann just did that with Aristotle. And it was a, it was a little very sly trick there. But uh, one author writes this. He says, uh, process theologians are well aware that Christian theology shares its vocabulary of being, usia, uh, physis, looks like physis, it's physis, but in the Greek about nature and so forth, being. Um, it, Christian theology shares its lingo with Platonic philosophy, with which it is very closely linked at a most crucial period of its classical development. And this, this guy's doing a little bit of reductionism here. They also know that in Platonism, the absolute being is static. Notice the card trick happening right now. Plato's God just like Moltmann did Aristotle's God. You know what's wrong with this? There's this and he can never love and now Aristotle's God, whoa! This author's doing the same thing. Now we all know that in the early centuries, these ideas, they, they uh, linguistically, they kind of were saying the same thing that Plato was. Therefore, Plato's God, the, the same card trick is happening right here. We all know that in Platonism, the absolute being is static since part of its perfection is the freedom to dwell in uninterrupted tranquility without any danger that this might be disturbed. Furthermore, it is clear that many of these ideas were incorporated into Christianity, particularly the belief that God is free from suffering or impassable, and that they appear to be unbiblical in certain respects. Now, he can make his case. You can say that Plato, they mean the same thing as Plato, number one. And by the way, it's not in the Bible. If you want to make that case, make that case. But what he's doing is committing the genetic fallacy by saying, and he's doing it in a very sly way by smuggling Plato in. It simply doesn't follow that just because they use the same word that Plato may have used and added a couple things that Plato may have agreed with about eternality and unchangingness. Therefore, it's Plato's God. Now, he didn't say it that way, but that is what he's saying. Now, a genetic fallacy really is guilty as charged if the idea can stand on its own. In other words, whether it had that source or not, whether Plato was the source, whether Aristotle was the source, it's an interesting, good question. But if the idea can stand on its own and you dismiss it and you say it's invalid or unsound simply because of its source, that is textbook genetic fallacy. The question is, not whether or not the early church fathers learned X from Plato or Aristotle, but rather whether the idea is true. The objection presupposes up front that X cannot be true if it is uttered both by the scripture and by a pagan. Therefore, it wouldn't be. And so that's no wonder scripture isn't saying the same thing as Plato. Well, you're assuming that up front. The burden of proof is on the critic to tell us why that is the case. The bottom line to both the philosophical objection and the historical, which turned out to just be the historical, uh, the philosophical with a genetic fallacy put in there, the problem is that it's philosophical. It's not at all a biblical argument or a historic argument. As Wayne Andy writes in his book, Does God Suffer? He says, quote, contemporary theologians have not come to the Bible and the fathers philosophically neutral but rather already convinced that an impassable and immutable God will not do, for these reasons, not personal. Thus, their interpretation of the Old Testament and the Fathers is driven, at least in part, by an already preconceived understanding of the philosophical issues involved and the philosophical answers that must be given." End quote. So, remember that formal argument that we saw with respect to immutability? Now let's use that same thing with impassibility. 
just to draw this out and nail it in a little bit more. Number one, same thing. I wish the board was as big as the whole room. I could just, all that is in God is God. Premise two, all that is in the divine persons is God. Well, why persons? Well, they said it's impersonal. I'm going to put persons is in God. And I know we haven't got to the Trinity yet either. I understand. Three, all that is in the divine persons is immutable. And that much we've already proven. Now, where does this take us? Premise four, to have passions or to suffer is to experience change. Because remember, passions was potentiality. Therefore, so by negating this, you arrive at this conclusion, no experience of a passion or to suffer. None of this, in other words, is in God. I suppose there might be easier ways to say that. But at any rate, and I know there is with potentiality, you could probably reduce it to a syllogism. But here I just wanted to take what we already had from the first session and just bring that down one notch. Now I'm adding the concept of persons here because that's the main thing that's really happening in the complaint. Um, now there's a way to think about emotions that can... Hmm, 842. And there's a good article, really good article actually. Um, it was in an academic journal called Themelios, and a lot of people read that or doing advanced studies in theology. But this particular author I'd never heard of, but, and I'll probably mispronounce it, so I apologize already, but Amos Winarto OA, and the last name is spelled O-E-I. The article's called, the, or the essay, The Impassable God Who Cried, and it's an argument for impassibility. And, um, but one of the things he does is he looks at the difference between emotions in God versus us and the principle of analogy. And he even quotes Paul Helm. And I think Helm's, I'm going on a rabbit trail here, but the thing that Helm wrote, and you'll hear me quote from Helm a lot starting next week when we talk about eternality and then we start talking about omniscience. He's a good guy. Um, Helm even quotes, or he, he coins a term called <laughs> fee motion. Now here he's borrowing the Greek word for God and then the rest of the suffix because, you know, we, we, we are affirming an even stronger sense of what they're after in emotion, but we're saying that it is impassable. We're saying, of course, that it's simple and so forth. I have a couple of paragraphs on that. If you're interested, I'll let anybody read it, but I think we're out of time and I think that would, it's, it's fairly complex. Um, and there's even another difficulty that I bring up. But I'm going to keep it at that. And next week we're going to talk about eternality. And I think the next attribute, just because it would go naturally with it, is the uh, immortality, the immortal God. We had not covered that yet. And I think it goes well under eternality. And then we'll be able to, to capture, um, start getting omniscience and deal with middle knowledge and all that fun stuff. So that's where we're going, starting next week.